Welcome to the second episode of Coffee for Two, a Halloween special, where I'm joined by an amazing friend who will help me co-host this episode. Please welcome Lena. Hello everyone, this is Lena. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank for the introduction and for having me as a guest on his podcast. Um, reading these stories and researching them a little was really intriguing and interesting, so I'm sure you all will like the stories. They're a little graphic, but... I hope that you'll enjoy them as much as I did. We are going to talk about some true crime stories, haunting stories, and disturbing movies. This episode is for people 18 and above, so I advise to anyone listening if you are under 18 or you are easily scared and disturbed, please stop here. To the people who are still tuning in, get your popcorn ready, because it's gonna be a wild and spooky ride. Section 1 is going to be about true crimes. Section 2 is going to be about hauntings, and section 3 is going to be about disturbing movies. We will not go into details of each section and story, therefore, if you would like to hear more about each story, there are links in the description for each of them. Enjoy. Section 1. True Crimes In September of 2014, a Utah teen returned to his home to find his parents and three siblings dead. The teen found a notebook lying around, and in the notebook was a to-do list, or in other words, a chores list for the teen. The list looked as if the parents were preparing to go on a vacation. The to-do list included chores such as feed the pets and find someone to watch after the house, etc. It appeared to be a murder-suicide, but there were no suicide note, no prior indication that they would do this, and no explanation. Police could not figure out why two parents would kill themselves and their four children. Not only that, why would they even write down a to-do list for the teen to find? For a year, no one knew exactly what happened to the family or what would drive the parents to do something unthinkable. In January of 2015, police released more chilling details about the case. According to accounts from family members and an investigation by the police, The parents were driven by a belief that the apocalypse was coming, and an obsession with a convicted killer caused them to to do a horrific act that would shock the citizens of Salt Lake. Jeffrey Lionel Dahmer, also known as the Milwaukee Cannibal or the Milwaukee Monster, was an American serial killer and sex offender who committed the murder and dismemberment of 17 men and boys between 1978 and 1991. Police officers spotted one of Dahmer's victims, Tracy Edwards, running down the street in handcuffs in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and upon investigation, they find one of the grisliest scenes in modern history, Jeffrey Dahmer's apartment. Edwards told the police that Dahmer had held him at his apartment and threatened to kill him, Although they initially thought the story was a joke and that Edwards was trying to play, the officers took Edwards back to Dahmer's apartment. Dahmer calmly explained that the whole matter was simply a misunderstanding and the officers almost believed him. However, they spotted a few Polaroid photos of dismembered bodies and Dahmer was arrested. When Dahmer's apartment was fully searched, a house of horrors was revealed. In addition to photo albums full of pictures of body parts, the apartment was littered with human remains. Several heads were in the refrigerator and freezer, two skulls were on top of the computer, and a 57-gallon drum containing several bodies decomposing in chemicals was found in a corner of the bedroom. There was also evidence to suggest that Dahmer had been eating some of his victims. Neighbors told both detectives and the press that they had noticed an awful smell coming from his apartment, but Dahmer explained it as being expired meat. However, the most shocking revelation about how Dahmer managed to conceal his awful crimes in the middle of a city apartment building would come a few days later. It was reported that the police had been called two months earlier about a naked and bleeding 14-year-old boy being chased down an alley by Dahmer. The responding officers returned the boy who had been drugged to Dahmer's apartment where he was killed. The officers who said that they believed it to be a domestic dispute were later fired. A forensic examination of the apartment turned up 11 victims, the first of whom disappeared in March 1989 
just two months before Dahmer successfully escaped a prison sentence for child molestation by telling the judge that he was desperately seeking to change his conduct. Dahmer later confessed to 17 murders, dating back to his first victim in 1978. The jury rejected Dahmer's insanity defense, and he was sentenced to 15 life terms. He survived one attempt on his life, but was killed by another inmate on November 28, 1994. Theodore Robert Bundy was an American serial killer who kidnapped, sexually assaulted, and murdered numerous young women and girls during the 1970s and possibly earlier. After more than a decade of denials, he confessed to 30 murders he committed in seven states between 1974 and 1978. Bundy had a difficult childhood. He had a strained relationship with his stepfather and his shyness made him a frequent target of bullying. Later, however, his intelligence and social skills enabled him to enjoy a successful college career, and he developed a series of apparently normal emotion, emotional relationships with women. Despite this apparent stability, he sexually assaulted and killed several young women in Washington, Oregon, Colorado, Utah, and Florida between 1974 and 1978. Although he would ultimately confess 28 murders, some estimated that he was responsible for hundreds of deaths. Following a well-publicized trial, he was sentenced to death in 1979 for the murder of two college students. In the following year, he again was sentenced to death, this time for the sexual assault and murder of a 12-year-old girl. Bundy was executed in Florida's electric chair in 1989. Despite the appealing nature of his crimes, Bundy became something of a celebrity, particularly following his escape from custody in Colorado in 1977. During his trial, his charm and intelligence drew significant public attention. His case inspired a series of popular novels and films devoted to serial murders. Killer Clown John Wayne Gacy John Gacy was an American serial killer born March 17, 1942 in Chicago, Illinois, and died May 10, 1994 in Statesville, Illinois. His murders of 33 boys and young men in the 1970s received international media attention and shocked his suburban Chicago community, where he was known for his sociability and his performance as a clown at charitable events and children parties. Gacy was born into a loving family and seemed to have had a fairly ordinary childhood, but he exhibited a growing tendency towards sadism, which resulted in several encounters with the law in the 1960s. In 1968, after his conviction for sexually assaulting a teenage boy, he was confined in the Iowa State Men's Reformatory and had to undergo psychological evaluation. After his release in 1970 and while still on parole, he was again arrested for sexual assault but the charges were later dropped. Gacy then became a fairly successful independent contractor and bought a house in suburban Chicago. In 1978, after one of Gacy's victims, Robert Piest, was reported missing, police learned that Gacy was the last person known to have seen him. After obtaining a search warrant, police discovered the bodies of 29 boys and young men in, in or near Gacy's house. Four other bodies were found in a nearby river. The area of the house had emitted a horrible smell for years, but Gacy had told his house guests and his wife that the smell was the result of moisture buildup. At his trial, Gacy's plea of innocence by reason of insanity was supported by the testimony of several psychologists who diagnosed him as schizophrenic, but was rejected by the jury, which found him guilty of all 33 murders of which he was accused. He was executed by lethal injection in 1994. Section 2. Hauntings The Kasha House of Kaimuki in Honolulu, Hawaii, has been shrouded in mystery for decades. Its first bad press mention hit was in 1941. According to the article, police responded to a call from a woman shouting, She's trying to kill my children. She's trying to kill my children. When they arrived, they found a young Hawaiian boy, his three sisters, and his mother all shrieking and being tossed around by nothing. About 30 years later, 
other occupants, occupants of either the same home or one block away from the haunted house reported similar attacks by an unseen force, which the responding officers corroborated. The two most common theories surrounding the source of these reported attacks are a demonic shape-shifting creature of Japanese folkloric origins known as the Kasha, and the angry spirit of a corpse buried in the backyard, though it has been torn down and replaced by condos. The dark energy still lingers, according to the locals and residents. The Lemp Mansion in St. Louis, Missouri. The Lemp Mansion is known to be one of the most haunted places in America due to a tragic history. The 33-room home was built in the 1860s by William Lemp, a successful brewery owner who ended up killing himself in 1904 after the youngest of his four sons, Frederick, had died. A few years later, his wife also died of cancer in the house. Then, in 1922, William Lemp Jr. shot himself in the same room William Sr. killed himself. As if that weren't enough tragedy for one place, in 1949, Charles Lemp, William's third son, shot his dog in the basement of the home and then killed himself in his room. That same year, the house was sold and transformed into a boarding house, where reports of hauntings began. According to Destination America, witnesses have experienced burning sensations and slamming doors. Today, the Lamp Mansion is a restaurant and occasionally holds events. Villa de Vecchi, located near Lake Como in Italy. The House of Witches dates back to around 1854 to 1857. When it was built as a summer house for Count Felix de Vecchi, the family was only able to spend a few years there, as their lives were mirrored in tragedy right after it was built. First, the architect died a year later after the construction, then in 1862, Count de Vici came home to discover his wife murdered and his daughter missing. When he could not find her after a year of searching, he died by suicide. His brother then moved into the home and his family continued to live there until World War II. It's been vacant since the 1960s and an avalanche in 2002 wiped out all the house in the area except House of Villa de Vici. Baron Palace, Cairo, Egypt. Placed in Heliopolis, Cairo, the Baron Palace is a centerpiece for spooky tales and legends in Egypt. This majestic place was built by Baron and Payne, a Belgian industrialist, colonial entrepreneur, and amateur Egyptologist in the 1900s. Its design was inspired by the Hindu temples of Odisha in India and Angkor Wat in Cambodia, both of which were admired by the Baron. The palace was designed with a rotating base in order to access the sunbeams at all hours of the day. A few years after its construction, the palace started to be surrounded by rumors of horror stories and paranormal activities. The rumors then increased with the death of the Baron's wife, who reportedly fell to her death from the palace's tower, and the death of his daughter a few years later. In fact, there are few who believe that the palace's iconic tower stopped turning during the time of the Baroness's death, as if in mourning of her death. Numerous people also believed that the palace held secret tunnels that would lead to the Helipolis Basilica, where Baron M. Payne was buried. Strange noises, chilling winds, hobbled whispers. These are a few spooky sounds I could experience upon visiting Al Jazeera Al Hamra in Ras Al Khaima. The island's homes, which were made of materials, coral, stones, and palm trunks, were once occupied by local tribes. But today, the homes are empty. Many of the tribe members have since migrated within the UAE due to the urbanization, and as a result, the emergence of new homes and opportunities. Nowadays, Al Jazeera Al Hamra is labeled as a ghost town, referring back to the tribe's abandonment and the fact it was left untouched and undeveloped since. However, the island's underdevelopment does not seem to be an issue as, according to UNESCO, Al Jazeera Al Hamra is now the last remaining traditional coastal town in Gulf, comprising narrow alleys, mosques, fort, 
watch towers and a souk set between the thousand of years old heritage of country yard houses. However, the island is not only known for its history, in fact, Jazirat al Hamra is most commonly known for its paranormal activities and alleged haunting incidents. In fact, this haunted reputation has grown so popular that its chilling legends spread to the west as well. Its stories were so widespread that Al Jazeera Al Hamra was chosen as one of the locations to film Brian Reynolds' action thriller movie titled Six Underground. The Haunted House of Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, sitting at approximately 100 meters from the seafront of the North Cornish, is one of the spookiest haunted houses in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Its jinn centered tales are well known amongst the people of Jeddah, turning even the toughest of people into petrified statues who wouldn't dare near it. In 2004, the house was said to have claimed 16 people who, according to Arab news, entered and never came out. Even today, the world still does not know of their whereabouts. Since then, the alleged horror house has sparkled fear into the residents of the area, forcing them to file numerous complaints and begging to have the house taken down. Situated in Oman's al Dakhliya government, this desert oasis is known as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, but it is also known as a haunted town. Paranormal creatures are said to live in the palm groves and the desert, deserted houses in the town center. In fact, the common narrative and legends surrounding these spirits states that they have built the historic 12 kilometer long city wall in one night. This horror filled legend was so popular that it allegedly drew the Western media's curiosity and caused them to consider it as a location for American actress Kristen Stewart's thriller movie Personal Shopper in 2015. However, an Omani official refuted this claim by clarifying that while Stewart indeed filmed at the Bahla historical fort as well as the 12 km Bahla wall, she did not film any horror scenes in the provenance itself. Bahla was also dubbed one of the 10th of the world's most haunted cities by National Geographic in 2014. Section 3. Disturbing Movies August Underground's Mordom Fred Vogel's Totak Pictures is an independent horror film production company and studio known for the low-budget, boundary-pushing works of extreme cinema they produce. Their defining statement comes in the form of a brutal, aggressively nihilistic, found-footed trilogy of mayhem known as August Underground. All three films involve a found family of serial killers traveling around and shooting footage of each other's miserable forms of torture and death on their helpless victims. All three films are shot in jagged, low quality, resulting in an aesthetic that feels like it's real footage. They all feature disturbing realistic effects and committed actors willing to do wild things to each other. But the second chapter, August Underground's Mordom, might be the most abjectly disturbing of the lot. Bodies are nothing more than anonymous opportunities for morbid dissections, and the Totak team is more than willing to shove it all in our face, with each scene managing to top the previous one in its horrific cruelty. A notorious 1980 horror film that is banned in several countries resulted in the director Ruggiero getting arrested and having to prove in court the special effects were faked, help kickstart a wave of cannibal exploitation cinema and influenced filmmakers and its awake, perhaps most explicitly Ali Roth with The Green Inferno. Cannibal Holocaust tells in the mockumentary form the story of a group of anthropologists who traveled to an Amazonian village to try and rescue a group of filmmakers left there. When they arrive, they discover reels of footage with horrific actions perpetrated by the cannibalistic natives resulting in a noted metatextual narrative that pokes aggressively at white severism, colonialism, and exaggerated violence. The images shown in unsparing detail are clearly designed to court controversy, and in some sequences of actual animal cruelty. It may walk in a line of its purposeless text for some, but there are no denying cannibal holocaust has a lot on its mind. Eraserhead 
The debut feature of Notorious Nightmare meteorologist David Link, Eraserhead, is likely the closest thing you'll ever feel to living in a real-life nightmare in cinematic form. Using black and white photography and inexplicably terrifying sound design, Lynch tells the story of Henry Spencer, a feeble and sensitive man who lives in a bizarre post-industrialized apocalyptic society. His life is turned all matters of upside down by the presence or threat of domesticity, child rearing and even the afterlife. Lynch presents these challenges both with a searingly skin-crawling style while the production design on his film is peerless in its atmosphere. So many of the film's haunting images occur almost inadvertently with no comment on its bleak oddness. All of this culminates in the revelation of a child whose visage remains controversial for the methods in which Lynch may have made it. This is the end to our special Halloween episode, and we hope you liked it. And a special thanks to Lena for joining and helping on this episode. Please make sure to look into the stories in details by the provided links below. And please recommend some topics you would like to hear. Until the next time, thank you for tuning in.